Wick is an entertaining place for a stopover. It's a mix of hard-headed, small-scale commercial shipping, a few fishermen and us softy sailors, and I really like that. There are always things going on. Scottish timber going to Holland and beyond. Watch this bloke as he straightens the ragged ends of the load by bashing it against the pile. is a fine place for a pontoon walk. These blokes do seem to have a bit of a fixation about dodgers and inside steering positions, which is always a bit worrying when you have an open cockpit. There are some beautiful wooden boats here though, and some perfectly formed work boats as well. Many with lovely curved sterns. They're now mostly used for recreational sea angling and amateur lobster pot scattering. But there's an admirably rugged down-to-earth look to most of them.
today is largely the work of Thomas Telford, Scotland's most famous civil engineer. Born in 1757 in the Scottish borders, the son of a lowly shepherd. At the age of 14, he was apprenticed to a stonemason, and his first bridge is this one at Langholm, still carrying the A47. At the age of 25, he moved to London, and his genius, not only for engineering, but also for his ability to drive a project rapidly to completion on budget and on time, was soon recognised. Somerset House, Portsmouth Docks, St Catherine's Dock in London all benefited from his engineering and project management skills. Then, under the patronage of Sir William Pulteney, he became the county surveyor for Shropshire, just as the Great British Canal building period started. He was great at bridges and built 40 of them in Shropshire alone before getting stuck into the Ellesmere Canal and the aqueduct with the difficult Welsh name. Incidentally, he invented a way of making a watertight joint between cast iron plates using melted sugar and molten lead. It makes you wonder what else he tried before finding that sugar worked as a sort of flux to draw the lead into the joints. He's unfairly thought of as something of a specialist in cast iron. He was certainly brilliant with it, but damn he knew how to work stone as well, and in his later years he turned to the business of building roads. In a nod towards ancient Mediterranean architecture, he was known as the Colossus of Rhodes. Not the best joke I've ever heard, but who am I to judge a 200-year-old pun? Then, in 1801, in cahoots again with William Pulteney, the richest man in England, and who now has a whisky named after him, he came up with a 20-year plan to revolutionise communications in the Highlands. A thousand miles of roads and a thousand bridges were built or improved under his management. He also came up with a cheap and cheerful, easily tweakable design for a small rural church and manse. The budget was £1,500 each, but his 32 churches and their associated manses came in at £750 a pop. No wonder the money men loved Telford. But at the time it was ships and water which oiled the wheels of commerce, so he built the Caledonian Canal, improved the Crinan, built harbours at Aberdeen, Dundee, Peterhead, Wick, Port Mahomac and Banff, and in Wick he created a purpose-designed, human-powered factory aimed at the processing of the seemingly limitless riches of the sea in the shape of the mighty herring. The Telford genius went even further because he not only designed the harbours, he also designed and project-managed the infrastructure of warehouses, workshops, rope walks, bakeries, accommodation for dock workers, shipwrights and the fishermen. He created high streets and parks for their recreation, social and civil engineering in one entity flowing from Telford's genius. As a British sailor, I've taken boats into his perfectly designed harbours and along his canals, through his tunnels, under his bridges and even over his aqueducts. I've walked and cycled the streets he laid out and eaten food in and bought chandlery from the premises he designed. All this from a son of a humble Scottish shepherd. Telford never married and died in London at the age of 77, his mind apparently as bright and clear as when he was at his prime. Absolutely astonishing bloke. As an engineer, makes me almost wish I was Scottish. Walking around Wick is a real pleasure. If you're a fan of L.S. Lowry, you can go and look at the Black Steps, which he painted in 1931. Never been a great fan of his art. Wind-swept stick figures crawling across grim urban landscapes. And any art I could do can't be real art as far as I'm concerned. Nevertheless, the painting of the Black Steps sold in 2013 for £890,000. Or, put it another way, 111 westerly centaurs. Just around the corner is a bombsite memorial. The dastardly Germans hit Wick twice in 1940, killing 18 people. Ten of them children. There's this idiosyncratic little memorial garden, complete with twee seals and painted on cormorant crap. 
there's the shortest street in Britain, Ebenezer Place, six foot nine inches long, just room for a door. The River Wick runs through a lovely park which is adorned with yet more slightly odd bits of art. And just down by the bridge, Wick has easily the worst municipal sculpture ever made. Presented to the town in 1906 by ex-provost W. Patterson Smith, who should have known better. Time, it was unpresented and returned to rubble, if you ask me. On the upside, Wick has the best graveyard of the trip so far. The whole place is cut into the side of a hill with graves like giant steps, now brilliantly overrun with scrub and trees. You couldn't build a better set for a horror film. There was a church here in the 1200s, dedicated to St Fergus, an Irish bishop who came to these parts to convert the heathen Picts to Christianity. The old churches have gone and been replaced with this edifice built in 1830. Best of all though is the Dunbar of Hemprig Memorial. The Dunbars were a family of turbulent toffs. They were really a dynasty of strong-minded women who generally produced strong-minded daughters and rather weak-willed sons who married women who were just like their own strong-minded mothers. The women wore the truths and decided who to fight and when. The Dunbars steered a very canny course to the Jacobite rebellions and were more than prepared to switch allegiance to the winning side. The image of the skull and crossbones is common in Scottish cemeteries and is nothing at all to do with pirates. The trumpeters are angels and Father Time is also depicted here. The next day, more boats started to arrive and flags appeared everywhere in preparation for Wick Harbour Day.
I do find bagpipes rather stirring things to listen to, as long as they're heard in the distance. I was also becoming a bit of an admirer of Scottish dancing, and among the dancers was this pair of girls from Wick, current national champions. I found their dancing completely entrancing. These girls did two dances, both utterly perfect. Longer versions are on the website. Then the weather came right for the journey to Orkney. Sadly though, Jake and Danny had run out of time and had to succumb to the curse of the young, a return to their London jobs. So we had a final meal together, and the next morning they departed for the deep south, leaving just Jill and I rattling around inside what now felt like a massive cabin. From here on in, it's just the two of us. And you blokes as well, of course. <laughs> 